All right, so um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our PRISM seminar today. Um, just a few quick reminders before we get started. Um, well, actually really only one reminder, which is to please stay on mute during the presentation, unless you'd like to ask a question and you could feel free to ask the question in the chat and I can uh, moderate it um, or, or you can just unmute yourself and, uh, and ask directly. And otherwise we'll have a chance for a Q&A at the end. Um, and uh, with that, let me introduce our speaker for today. Um, so today we are really delighted to welcome Dr. Nikhil Garg, who is a postdoctoral associate at Berkeley and will be an assistant professor of operations research and information engineering at Cornell Tech starting this July. His research interests are in the application of algorithms, data science, and mechanism design to the study of democracy, markets, and societal systems at large. Dr. Garg received his PhD from Stanford and a Bachelor's of Science and Bachelor's of Arts from UT Austin. Most recently, he was a principal data scientist at PredictWise, which provides election analytics for political campaigns. And he also received the INFORM's George Danzig Dissertation Award and second place at the MSOM student paper comp competition. So with that, um, I'll invite uh, Dr. Garg to share his slides and we can get started. Um, thanks, Ravi. Uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying being here. Uh, I think, uh, I think this will be a, good, a fun audience to give this talk to, and I'd love this for this to be as interactive as possible. So please do not hesitate to interrupt and ask questions. And um, I'm not sure I'll be able to see the chat. So um, if, if you type something in and I wasn't able to see it, just like interrupt me. So let me share my screen. And, and I think actually my co-authors are here. So if, if, they wanted, if they want to help answer any questions, they're welcome to do so as well. Um, okay. okay. Can everyone see my screen? I can't. It's cut off. Oh, it's cut off. Oh. Interesting. Has it never happened before? Is this better? Um, yes, that looks good to me. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, I, I see there's already some captioning going on, so let me turn off my captions. Okay, cool. Okay, so everyone, I'm happy to be here and talk about um, this paper, uh, this new paper, Dropping Standardized Testing for Admissions, Differential Variance and Access. Um, this is joint work with Bedner Monahu and Hannah Lee, who are both uh, fifth year PhD students at Stanford right now. And they're both gonna be on the job market next year, so y'all should hire them. Um, okay, so um, sort of the context of this paper is that of course, partially due to COVID-19, a lot of you, or almost exclusively due to COVID-19 last year, a lot of universities suspended their testing policies just because a lot of students didn't have access to be able to physically go to a testing center and take a test. Um, but really this has been part of a broader trend uh, of reconsidering whether to waive SAT and ACT requirements for undergrad admissions and GRE admissions and, and GRE for graduate admissions. So for example, the University of California actually um, in May um, sort of announced a plan that was actually a long time coming that sort of was thinking about phasing out the SAT over a five year period and uh, potentially replacing that with a, a new test of their own design. And sort of this, like uh, sort of, a, I'm sure everyone here is aware, but whenever we start thinking about dropping test score, there's always a discussion of sort of like, you know, everyone wrings their hand about this trade off between, um, you know, is dropping test scores about, um, you know, expanding access and equity, or is it about uh, sort of, you know, or will dropping it be like bad because it, um, we no longer have a signal of quality uh, about students. And sort of, I'm just gonna like give characters of both arguments right now, um, and then, you know, talk about specifically what we focus on here. So on the side of the fact that, of, of the claim that dropping test scores will lead to the admission of less prepared students is um, sort of this claim that, you know, tests are just systematic means of collecting information. If we think about, for example, a Bayesian optimal classifier or just any optimal decision-making system, if 
you know, if tests were bad information, then the optimal decision maker just wouldn't think about it. That like that tests are never worse than no tests because it's strictly more information. Um, and then of course, um, other component, like, you know, tests are not the only aspects of admissions that, you know, might display disparities or might be biased in some way. So for example, there's a lot of literature that recommendation letters are systematically biased against exactly the groups that you might think that they're systematically biased against. Um, and then there's some sort of a potentially more subtle argument, which is actually the one that we end up focusing on here in our paper, which is that um, tests are often the um, only great quality of signal that you have about certain students, especially underrepresented students. So for example, like, you know, some Stanford admits like 30 kids a year from Palo Alto High School, which is across the street from Stanford. Stanford knows a lot about that high school. They know the teachers, they know exactly how to read the transcripts, they know the recommendation, they know how to read the recommendation letters, and they can, I would bet, fairly nicely sort of be able to like identify the best students from that high school from everyone else. Um, whereas for, for you know, high schools that Stanford's not familiar with, they might have a hard time knowing, like, how do I read the transcript? Who are the teachers who sort of like really knows everyone? And it just might have a hard time, even internally within that high school, ranking the people from that high school from like on whatever metric Stanford cares about. And so the New York Times um, had an article about um, dropping tests because of the pandemic sort of had this quote um, in an article last year that without tests, it might be really hard to evaluate students from little known schools. And I'll, for, I'll sort of formalize what I mean by this in a little bit. And then on the other hand, that uh, sort of the claim that dropping tests will expand access or equity, sort of the initial claim is just, you know, that you can just see this in the scores that there's racial and social and economic gaps in test scores. Um, then sort of when we think about why that might be, the, um, there's huge preparation disparities. So something like 8% of lower income and almost 80% of high income students use test prep services. And so for two kids of, you know, you know approximately like, you know, it, it's always weird to talk about like, you know, whatever, what these constructs mean, but for two students with, you know, approximately similar potential, um, if one has access to the test prep score, they might get systematically biased upward scores compared to another student. Um, but then there's something uh, even maybe uh, even more pernicious going on in the sense that there's a test access question where um, the study from 2016 found that or sort of estimated that um, about one, a full one third of uh, low income students um, who would be like who would score college ready on exams based on, for example, their high school grades um, end up just not taking the SAT or ACT for whatever reason, just either access to tests for, you know, it takes time, it, it costs money, it costs money to send scores. For a variety of reasons, they just don't end up taking the test. And um, of course, this is um, sort of anecdotal evidence in the sense that there's nothing causal here going on, but this year UC Berkeley, um, across most of its um, graduate departments, dropped the GRE requirements. Um, and they saw about an 82% increase in the number of underrepresented minority applicants to their graduate programs. Um, and this is compared, and so they, they did see an increase across the board, but the comp um, sort of the increase in applicants overall was like about 20, 30%. And so the specific increase of underrepresented applicants was quite a bit more. Um, of course, I don't wanna read too much into this and they, they also did a lot of other things this year as part of a broader effort, they increased outreach. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, so they increased outreach and sort of, yeah, did a lot of other things besides the GRE, but this is one maybe uh, anecdote. And so what we do in this paper, um, what we try to think about is, so like, let's, let's take both of these arguments seriously. Let's, like, let's, let's take seriously the fact that tests might provide useful information, especially about underrepresented students. Um, but at the same time, they might be inaccessible um, to some or many students um, and might be disproportionately inaccessible to um, sort of underrepresented um, people. And then um, how do we reason about these two effects? 
um, and think about the effect of dropping diversity in academic merit and how do how are sort of students individually or heterogeneously affected. And um, I'll sort of go into this in a little bit, but I am um, sort of I, I think one of the implications of what we find is that really this like canard about diversity versus academic merit, like sort of these two objectives might not trade off. That in the setting that you're in, depending on either the information set, like sort of how much information they provide versus how inaccessible they are, um, often these two objectives move in the same direction. That if, if, a t if dropping the test is good for diversity, it's also good for academic merit um, and so on. But I see there's a few questions in the chat, but I don't know what they are. So if someone wants to just interrupt me. Sure. I'll, um, uh, I, I, maybe I'll just I'll just say what um, Jack said. So, so, but Jack, feel free to chime in if you want. So, um, Jack says that Hyman paper is outdated and contradicted by the UC Faculty Senate's research from 2019 that they did in support of making their recommendations to the regents. Um, so, perhaps. A, sorry, again, Jack, feel free to um, add to that if you want. Um, but otherwise, that's uh, that's what was in the chat. No, I, I and I didn't want to interrupt. I just really am happy to discuss later. And, and Ravi, you have a better uh, radio voice than I do anyway. So thanks for reading. Okay. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that quite a bit. Um, the Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about sort of what the current state of the art is of like whether access is like a huge deal or not as well um, in, in this sense. Yeah, so um, yeah, so what, what we do is we do quantify um, sort of through mostly through uh, like theoretically in a model, this trade off between um, the informational aspects that tests provide and their potential uh, negative exclusionary nature. And then what we find is that dropping the test can be uh, detrimental to all objectives if the test provides useful information, but it can, for example, also improve all metrics if it does not. Um, and then, so this is always like the very tricky child. So mostly we do this through a, th a theoretical model. And then the second part is like mostly tricky and you know, it's hard to know whether we have the right kind of data and so on. Um, but we demonstrate how one, if one had certain kinds of data, one could empirically make such a decision. Now, of course, this is a very hard thing to do. And so sort of our empirical section is not really empirics as much as calibrated simulations. And I'll get to that at the end. Um, but we sort of, the finding of that is, does show that like sort of the, the specific informational content of the test very much determines um, sort of the effect on these objectives, that, it very, that like, it's very hard to make a state, statement at a high level without knowing the specific empirical context or sort of like the specific informational content of the test. Um, and sort of from a more theoretical modeling perspective, we believe that our multidimensional framework um, that we introduce, that I'll go into in a little bit, is well suited to the study of the role of data and features in fair machine learning in general. Sort of um, as I go into our model as a fairly natural extension of classical statistical discrimination models that really emphasizes um, the relationship between multiple kinds of information. Okay. Um, yeah, so I am going to spend probably most of the time on the model and the theoretical results. And then I'll end with these calibrated simulations using the, the Theop data from the University of Texas at Austin, if um, any of you are aware of that data set. And then um, at time permitting, at the very end, I'm going to conclude with a sneak peek of um, ongoing work that is um, sort of also on the same testing regime, but slightly different model. And that's where I think especially I might love some of y'all's domain expertise on testing. Okay. And so at a high level, the work relates to um, a sort of um, uh, sort of fairly natural follow-ups to both the economics of discrimination literature, sort of this is mostly talk about statistical discrimination from Becker and Phelps sort of back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, um, and also sort of combined with the more recent fairness and machine learning and mechanism design literature. And sort of what we get from both or um, sort of what we merge from both is the effect that really data and features and sort of maybe um, sort of like foundational properties of these features relate to the downstream decision task at hand. Okay. 
So now I'm going to dive into the model. Um, and I am going to keep it fairly high level in the sense that I'm going to try to minimize the number of math, like sort of the amount of math that I introduce. And so what we have is um, we start out with a bunch of students, so a continuum of students who um, sort of uh, have some unobserved truth skill that is distributed normally. And each student belongs to some socioeconomic group G. And sort of crucially, we, uh, we assume that the true scales are sort of have the same distribution across both groups. So there's a priori no difference um, across the two groups. Uh, but the school doesn't observe um, the true skill, rather the school observes application components. Um, so we have what are called, uh, what we just say are K noisy features. And each of these features are just drawn from a normal um, that has mean um, sort of the true skill plus some potential bias. So for example, like the bias term could just be that certain groups get systematically better recommendation letters um, for whatever reason. But then there's also an, um, a variance term, which is that there might just be noise in the features and certain groups might have less noise than other groups in the features. And then, but whatever these application components are, so each student um, now has a set of um, these features and all the school does is this, the school just like tries to backward estimate the true scale from the features. So it just uh, in a Bayesian manner, it says, okay, so it's like, you know, someone with these features has, you know, on, the, on average has um, this scale. And so this is the scale estimate that they form for each student. And then the school is just gonna admit um, sort of in this very naive model, admit the, the highest mass, um, so sort of, sort of not the highest mass, the, the, the students with the highest skill estimates up to its capacity. Now, of course, this is like an extremely contrived model for education. Um, Y'all can tell me like a hundred ways why this is a terrible model. Mostly, you know, the fact that we're looking at one dimensional um, scale at the end of the day, that the school is Bayesian in this estimation that the school, like, right, just there's like a million ways that this does not relate to how admissions is done in practice. Um, but we thought that this was a decent, decent enough model to specifically look at the role of one feature in particular, which is a t uh, sort of how does dropping one feature affect this very contrived decision-making process at least. And sort of the idea being that if, um, for example, if one feature affects even what a Bayesian optimal school would do, um, like you know, what an optimal decision-maker would do in some sense, then it probably is having at least those similar effects in real decision makers. Okay, so just a few things I wanted to highlight with this model. Um, like I said, we do assume that um, both groups have the same true skill distribution. Um, and then, uh, in, however, in our drawing of the features, there can be group dependent bias terms. For example, test prep can shift scores upward for one group compared to the other group. Um, and uh, as we'll see in a little bit, um, these bias terms uh, in our model can be exactly corrected for. And so like they end up not playing a role at all for the optimal decision maker. On the other hand, we have estimation noise, which is like just like how noisy is, like how informative is this feature for the underlying true scale. And this is something that even an optimal decision maker who knows everything about the model um, cannot exactly correct for. And in particular, we're going to consider the case when um, one group just has, like there's systematically better information about one group than there is about another group. And so think of like group A as being like the Palo Alto high school kids who are extremely familiar and easy to evaluate for Stanford and maybe group B being um, students from another high school who um, sort of Stanford is less familiar with, for example. Um, and so that, that's sort of the precision of group A is more than the precision of group B overall. Um, and then finally in our model, we're gonna say that only a um, sort of this last feature, theta K, is only accessible to a subset of people. So there's only a fraction gamma, uh, of students gamma who have, who, have who have access to this last feature and um, of course, sort of in our assumptions, we're gonna, or, or what we're primarily gonna think about in this talk is the sort of group 
group A students, the ones from Palo Alto High School, have far more access to the test than uh, group B students. And so then the trade-off that we primarily study in this paper is the school needs to think about being, the school is in one of two domains, has to be in one of two places. The school can either drop the test um, and sort of only observes um, thetas one to K, it sort of only observes features theta, theta one to K minus one, but all students end up applying. And then the second, it keeps the test. And so it observes all the features, but only a fraction um, end up applying. And then what we ask in this extremely stylized model, how does this decision affect um, academic merit, which is, uh, we just define as the expected scale of admitted students. How does it affect the diversity level, which is the fraction of group B students in each admitted class. And um, what we call the individual fairness gap, which is the difference in admissions prob probability between two students of the same true scale, but who belong to different groups. Um, and yeah, so um, sort of on, on Jack's comment, um, yeah, this is of course an extremely stylized model. Um, what we believe at least it, it, it is useful for is trying to quantify a little bit more this trade-off between just like one extra, like one extra piece of information and the access barriers. So um, sort of in the stylized setting or sort of in, in the standard machine learning context, what is um, sort of what is the effect on the downstream? Um, yeah, so what is the effect on the downstream decision if we have to trade off getting more data, sort of more data per observation versus just getting more observations? Okay. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to be a pest and I'll stop, I promise. I, I just, I guess, what are they maximizing other than uh, picking? Because we know a lot about what admissions folks say they're trying to maximize. And we also know a lot less, but still a bunch about what their behavior suggests they're actually doing. Yeah. But I, I feel like that's the missing, I, I mean, obviously uh, yeah. expecting to have to stylize a lot of aspects of the complexity out of this, but that seems to be the part that I need to know more. Ah, perfect, okay. So, um, so, so yes, of course, like in practice, like, you know, they're, they're trying to compose a class that has all, like they're trying to compose an opt like some great set of students that will interact well with each other that's diverse that sort of, yes, yeah, schools are of course not just, for example, just optimize ac academic merit. Um, and so what we end up doing in our model is we don't explicitly say what the school is maximizing. We, we say that there's um, these two, sort of these main two objectives, um, academic merit, which is the expected scale of who gets admitted by sort of the Q. And then there's um, the diversity level, which is just, the fraction of each group that's admitted. And then we, um, we'd say, sort of, we ask is how are these two things um, affected by um, the decision? And so we don't make, we don't sort of, um, yeah, so, so, so basically for each of these two, so, so for each of these two objectives, even when you drop the test or keep the test, you can have different policies that trades off between them, right? So you can yeah. like most naively do like, affirmative action that like fixes the fraction of group B students at a certain level and then like grabs the best student modulo to that constraint. Um, and so we sort of we sort of think about that as independent as sort of orthogonal to this decision of dropping the test. I, I think it is except for in so far as we know that they could pay a cost for example to learn more about the sending ah, school right or yeah. And they do. They'll send a, a campus visit team out to learn about that high school or do some research, right? It's a non-zero cost, but there's yeah. there's ways to to put the scores in context uh, besides um, taking what they're given. And, yeah, perfectly. And and yes, exactly. And so and that that is is certainly in some sense that what's like UC Berkeley is trying to do at scale with like designing a new test that it thinks will like just have better information than like the ACT or ACT for everyone. And of course you can invest, like sort of like, like you said, invest in specifically finding high school. So yes, in, in this work, we don't consider like these alternative policies of like getting more information about certain groups um, and sort of how you could like, or at least in explicitly we don't, like you, we could easily, like you could easily think about that in our model in terms of like, like 
just like cost of investment to like reduce the variance of different features. So like, um, well, uh, sort of all of our theoretical results are like, how are these things object, um, affected by like, this variance term? And you could think about an investment a school can make as in reducing like one of these variance terms or reduce or like adding a new feature that reduces, that has small variance. Um, yeah, so that, that's stylized, but like one could start thinking about like richer intervention models. Um, in this work, the only intervention model that we think about is like, just like the effect of one additional feature um, that may or may not be accessible to everyone. Yep, great question. Um, yes, and, and we certainly don't take like a huge opinion on like the schools trading off between academic merit and diversity level. And then we also look at the effect on individual students. Okay, and of course we think about, uh, like I just said, if we think about how these decision, this decision and its effects are uh, mediated by the relationship between the variances to each other and overall, and also the access levels. Okay, and so um, I'm now ho hopefully over the next four or five slides, um, just present the paper and the map and pictures. I'm gonna try to give very little like sort of equations. There'll, there'll be a few equations here, but if I do a decent job by in the next four or five slides, um, all the theoretical results will just like be obvious if they're not obvious already. Um, and uh, yeah, so let, let's just dive in. And so um, the primary thing to th um, that I'm gonna show is just a joint distribution between true skill levels, Q, and skill estimates, Q tilde. And so, uh, and then of course there's this diagonal line where if the school can perfectly estimate everyone's skill level given the features, then the joint distribution is just gonna be on this diagonal line. And then at the top, I'm gonna to show sort of the marginal distribution of the skill estimates, the, like across the entire population. And then on the right, I'm gonna show the marginal distribution of the true skills um, also across the entire population. And then sort of um, in this model, what ends up happening is every student above some threshold um, of skill estimate gets admitted. So every student in this um, sort of grayed out box will get admitted. Okay, so this is um, sort of like one possible joint distribution where we look across the entire population as opposed to just groups. And so the school is gonna be noisy. So the school is not gonna like, it can't perfectly estimate true skill from the features. It's gonna be, you know, some distribution um, like this. And then there's a few things to point out here. Sort of the first one is the skill uh, estimates are by definition just um, like th th this like Bayesian estimation of the expected Q given the features. Um, and then one thing to point out here is that the, in our model at least, the, bi the school can theoretically cancel out the bias perfectly but this, um, by the subtraction, but the school can't, can't cancel out the information. Um, sort of this, this is not maybe too insightful to look at. What might be more insightful to look at is the induced distribution across the entire population. And so if we look at, this marginal distribution, which is just what, what's the distribution of skill estimates across the entire population. Um, in this model, at least, the school can estimate the mean correctly. So the mean looks exactly like the mean skill level of the population, but the variance looks like something smaller, right? So this is different than the marginal skill distribution. In particular, the variance is smaller. So skill levels get regularized toward the mean. And that's because um, sort of, if I don't have perfect information on someone, then I'm gonna err on the side of saying that they look closer to the average student. Um, and then, okay. Um, so then in that joint distribution, so that's sort of like a standard setting. And then what happens if groups have differential information? And so we end up seeing something like this, where the green group is sort of, the group that I had last time that you have a pretty good amount of information. But then this pink group is the group that I, I see more at variance in their features. And then they get regularized toward um, sort of, they get their estimates in general get regularized toward
toward the mean. And so even if overall they have the same skill distribution as the other group, even a perfect, even a, a perfect estimation of their skills is going to be like, you know, like because of how noisy their features are, I'm going to think that each individual student is closer to average than otherwise. And so sort of this gets rotated um, toward the mean. And so, for example, on average, someone with whatever this means, true skill negative one, uh, doesn't have that much worse skill estimate than someone with true skill one. And that's purely because of this like weighting effect on the precisions of each individual feature. And then of course, because the group estimates are noisier, if the school is admitting less than half the people, then fewer group B students. And it's in this case, purely admitting based on like a cutoff on academic merit. So like I haven't talked about like you know, a balance between diversity and academic merit or anything yet. If it's purely admitting based on academic merit, then fewer are admitted as a result. And then um, sort of another thing that we look at is um, what's called the individual fairness gap, which is let's fix the skill level Q for two individuals. So let, let's, for example, fix Q equals two. Then um, what is the probability of admission for someone of one group versus the other group. And so for example, here we can see that the pink group has, for someone with skill level Q equals two, their estimates range from about negative one to one. Whereas someone in the blue group, um, their estimates uh, for that same skill level, their estimates range from about zero to two. And the, the, the mass of students above the admission threshold is far more for one group than the other. And so, uh, noise in particular ends up um, differentially affecting uh, high skill students uh, of group B. And this is sort of what the New York Times are trying to get at, I think, and sort of the New York Times interpreted in our model. Okay, and so in the same model, what happens when schools, uh, when groups have differential barriers, but similar information? So let's forget the information effect and let's just think what happens when group A has more access to the test than group B? Um, then fewer group B students can apply and so fewer are admitted. And so this is just shown by the marginal count distribution is smaller than for group B than is for group A. And so you just see a smaller mass of students like even in this graph overall. And so of course, a smaller mass of students are gonna be over the threshold line and are admitted. And then the paper is just about how do we reason about choosing between these two worlds? How do we, um, you know, theoretically, but maybe with like perfect ideal information that we never have, think about um, I'm going to be, you know, in a world without test scores versus a world with test scores. Um, of course, under the assumption that a world without test scores does look like this, does look like differential information. Um, and of course, you could think about under other interventions, like Jack said, that maybe brings us back to maybe a world with test scores. And of course, ideally, what we would have is something that looks like the mixture of these two, where information looks like this world, but access looks like this world. Uh, and then the question is, is can schools invest in interventions that get us to that world? Okay. So what are the theoretical results? Um, I'm just gonna sort of like breeze through them in some sense. Um, so first we just look at the effect of differential information without barriers. Um, and so let's just say that we have better information on one group than the other, then like exactly what you might expect happens, what I just showed in pictures, that, the gr that group B students are underrepresented if the school is just maximizing academic merit. Um, in particular, high-skilled group B students are the ones particularly hurt and they have lower admissions probability than same-skilled group A students. And um, overall, the school has sort of, uh, and because of that, the school has worse targeting of disadvantaged students is sort of amongst those admitted, it can do a better job of identifying the best group A students than group B students. And this is just like in words, what this, what this graph is showing and what I showed in this graph earlier. 
And then what happens when you drop the test? If you don't consider the barriers aspect, um, so if you, if you just consider the informational aspect, then again, what you might expect, um, academic merit of both groups goes down. Um, if the information gap goes up, so if, if it does indeed sort of rotate like the plot uh, posits, then the diversity level worsens, otherwise it can improve. Um, and the admissions probability for all high school students decrease. And that's just going from this world to this world. And I think, you know, of course, not folks in, in, in you know, well-versed in education, but I think this is the mistake that people outside of education often make is that this is the world that we live in purely, that we purely live in an inform like where the information effect is the only thing that matters. Certainly, if you like look at all the fairness and machine learning literature, often you see that this informational effect is the only thing that matters as opposed to like another effect of like the composition of your data set. Um, but then when, when you um, sort of theoretically, when you do look at the composition of the, the data sets or you know, the composition of the applicant pool, then it turns out across all the objectives across academic merit, diversity, individual fairness gap, just the admissions probabilities of high school students, all of them can go up or down and depending on sort of the specific relationship. And I don't wanna to go too much into it here. Um, it's in the paper that sort of, or I'm happy to talk about it later, but like we characterize what these thresholds look like. Um, and at a high level, they might be exactly what you think is that there's like some trade-off between the variance of the test score and the access level. And um, sort of the exact place of the threshold changes per objective function, but sort of roughly, you know, in some region, it's harmful for all the objectives, in some region, it's helpful for all objectives. Um, and then I think this is um, maybe partially getting at um, sort of, I, I do want to make a small note here, which is, I think, partially getting at one of the questions Jack had, which is, um, so far, I just assume that the school maximizes um, what I call academic merit, just sorts everyone by skill estimates and just admits the top. Now that's clearly not what a school does in practice. Um, what I'm about to say is clearly not what affirmative action is in practice either. It's um, hopefully some, you know, some naive stylized model of what affirmative action is, which is let's just say that if the school can observe groups, then it can trivially set the diversity level, right? So I can just like, I can like, you know, in this model, the school can trivially say, I want a fraction pi of my students uh, who I admit to be from group B and fraction one minus pi to be from group A. And like one trivial way to do that is it can just admit students with best, with like the best estimates separately of each group. Um, of course, you know, legality and practicality and all of that is a separate concern, but in this like optimal model, the school can do that. Um, However, what it um, sort of what we show is that this doesn't, and so, so in the paper, we look at sort of the combination of these types of policies and the decision to drop or require the test score. And sort of at a high level, we show that these sort of policies um, are, are, speak, are speaking to different objectives. And so what affirmative action in this sense is perfect at is, is a setting the group level diversity, but it doesn't solve the information aspect which is you really want to identify the highest skilled group B students as well. Um, and of course, it doesn't help the fact that you can't admit those who don't, who don't apply. And so if you're still requiring the test score, then um, there's some of those folks. And sort of what I've plotted here is just a comparison over all of these policies over um, sort of on the individual fairness gap. So what is the difference in admissions prob probability for someone in group skill two, the difference between if they were in group A versus in group B. And as you can, as we can see is um, affirmative action does, for example, reduce this fairness gap. So the green policies are without affirmative action, the pink are with affirmative action, and they are reduced, but that there is this extra effort, there is this extra effect with the information. And in particular, ideally you would get information that brings this pink level down is that these are the type of interventions like um, sort of getting more information, requiring the test or not, or so on, that, br that brings this pink level down. Okay. Um, and so 
Um, I'm going to end with, a, again, a very stylized application to data. I want to see this more as a calibrated simu um, simulation because there's a lot of data that, you know, either we don't have or one could never hope to have. And, but we're at least um, sort of, we're, we're, I, I want to at least speak to a little bit is, can we even hope to do anything to try to make an informed decision in practice? And so like, what data do we need? Of course, we need student application data. And so you need something like test scores, some scale of recommendation letters, high school academic performance, and so on. Um, you need some proxy for what we're gonna call a true scale. Um, what we're gonna do, which is a, not a great proxy, but it's, it's you know, not a terrible one either, which is just look at the GPA at the time of college graduation. Now, of course, it's not a great proxy because, for example, the school can do a lot of things to, you know, if a, if a school is an inhospitable environment for certain students, then their, their GPA at time of college graduation is itself going to be like a, not a great estimate of what their true skill or true potential is. Um, in our data simulations, we sort of thought that this was the best thing that we could think of. Um, now, of course, even if you make this assumption that you have both of these things, the issue with any data analysis here is that you need outcome data for both those accepted and enrolled and those who were not accepted and did not enroll. Otherwise, if you just look at amongst the set, if you, for example, if you just look at the correlation between um, test scores and GPA amongst the students enrolled, then of course that's a collider where you're conditioning on the fact that students were admitted. And students were admitted looking at the GPA data. And so that completely like destroys any correlation that you, like amongst the things that you care for. So cool. Um, and so given these like fairly high data requirements to like do any sort of reasonable analysis, um, what can we do? And so the data that we used is from the Texas Higher Education Project, Oppor Higher Education Opportunity Project, just focusing on UT Austin um, before the top 10% rule was um, like be before the top 10% rule. And so we have application data like a very coarse um, high school class rank, standardized test score, demographic features, and then like features about their high school. So like the, rel like the, like the percentage of students from that high school who needed economic um, sort of economic support of some kind. And so that's like some measure of economic privilege of the high school. And then we have admissions and enrollment data. So who got admitted ultimately and who enrolled. And then for everyone who enrolled, you have for each semester, their GPA, their number of credit hours, and like and the major that they were in. And so um, sort of the setting that we simulate because of this confounding issue that we can't we can't do even a calibrated simulation for you know people admit admittance to UT Austin because you only have the quote unquote true skills of the people who are admitted. So we can't do that simulation. So we let's pretend that we're simulating a setting where UT Austin freshmen are applying to an honors program. Um, and you know that accepts maybe 20% of students. And then for their true skill, we look at again their final GPA, not counting the first year. Um, and then the student group we say is did the student attend a high school in the top half of economic privilege? And then we say that let, let's say that there's two feature sets. There's let's say that this this, this admission to the honors program is happening at the time of admission to the university. And the school has, so the school has no more data than for when they admitted the student to the university. That's what we're calling the low information setting. So they just have in our data set, the college that they're going to go into, their high school class rank course into I think 10% and then their test score. And then let's say we're in a high information setting where rather the school um, chooses to say, let's admit everyone um, at the end of their first year, as opposed to during their first year, or like at the beginning of their first year. And so at the end of their first year, they also have the first year GPA of everyone. And then we say in this low and high information setting, what is the diff like, what is the um, sort of, if you, if you drop or include the test score. Um, and then we impose an access assumption, but this ends up not really mattering in our um, results, which is only two thirds of the disadvantaged students have access to the test score. Um, I do want to admit something very funny here. 
which is um, that the like I'm only looking. I'm saying my population is those who got admitted to UT Austin, and they all had the TET score. But then I'm pretending that two third that one third of them didn't have, or one third of disadvantaged students of certain students didn't have access to the TET score. So that that is very funny. That's sort of like a limitation of our analysis. Um, the question is, is would it be useful to adjust GPA for difficulty of major? Um, yeah, so that's exactly what the model will end up doing because uh, the major college is one of the features. So um, the, um, yeah, so, so that'll exactly be adjusted for. Okay, and so the procedure is you can build models for each group to estimate final GPA. The results I'm gonna pre uh, present are with OLS, but you could do random for, you could do whatever model and the results don't really change. It really is about the informational content. And so what we find is in the low information case, you really do need this extra test score. That dropping the test is harmful for all the objectives. Um, and if you see, sort of, if you, if you look at the data a little bit more, what you end up seeing is amongst the people from like these low economic privilege high schools, their class rank is extremely uninformative of, of how they end up doing um, at UT. But amongst the people who come from like fairly high economic privilege, the um, sort of the, the high school class rank actually tends to be pretty informative. But again, that's conditioning on those who are admitted. Um, but in the high information setting, um, dropping the test score is helpful for all, all objectives. And sort of, and that's because once you have one year of uh, undergrad GPA, um, turns out nothing else is informative. That you can drop all the features and like your, your estimates basically don't change at all that like someone's first year GPA is like vastly more informative than like how they did in high school, their SAT, anything else. And so, um, and so this is just like one demonstration that again, this, like, this effect to drop the test or not is very dependent on the quality of the other information that you have. Like we can't just reason about like how informative the test score is without like specifically reasoning about how informative our other features are and then like potentially playing around with a model like this and in a calibrated simulated study. Okay. Um, so just to wrap up, um, we sort of quantify this trade-off between um, the informational aspect and the inclusion, inclusionary nature of the test. Um, and then we, you know, we, we, we show that really it's not a trade-off between objectives like academic merit and diversity, but it's really about like does informate like what's the informational content and does that help all your objectives or hurt all your objectives? Um, and then for those of you maybe more on the fairness machine learning side, um, we really believe that this sort of multi-dimensional framework is um, a useful one going forward to study the role of data in fair machine learning. And then maybe in just like one minute or two minutes, I'm going to sort of talk about some ongoing work and this is where I'm basically crowdsourcing some ideas and some like initial feedback, which is one thing we didn't talk about at all, which is um, can't schools do test optional, right? So ideally we just say, you don't have to submit test scores, but you can. And um, basically every, and partially and mostly because of the pandemic this last year, like 500, over 500 schools, including NYU, Berkeley, Cornell, Stan, basically every school I'm familiar with um, has signed the statement that um, says um, the following colleges with test option policies affirm that they will not penalize students without a test score. Um, and, and so they, and then, yeah, so they all signed a policy that says test optional means test optional. And so the question is, is like, what does, no one has defined test optional yet. Um, what does test optional mean? And so in this crowdsourcing, so let's, so let, I'm gonna introduce a little bit new notation. Um, let Z donate whether a student has denote whether a student has access to the test, and let Y denote whether a student is admitted. And so, one definition of test optional is that we ignore test scores, right? That basically the probability of admission, um, even if I look at a test score, is the same as if I just don't look at that test score for everyone, for anyone, right? 
And so it's really, this is saying that the school is dropping test scores without explicitly saying they're dropping test scores. Um, maybe there's something else, which is, um, and so th these are like the two extremes that I could also think about. The other one is, you know, uh, I don't actually know these true skills, but like ideally what I want is someone who has the same skill as someone who has access to the test score should not be disadvantaged in admissions. Right, so someone, um, yeah, so you just use equalized probability admission depending on true skill. Um, there's a few other notions one could define. I did sort of, I don't want to get into them because they're a little bit hairy and we still don't have the right articulation yet. But um, yeah, there, there's also, you know, potentially a million other test optional things. So I'd love if, you know, in the chat or coming to, up to me afterwards, what everyone's intuitions are for what test optional means. Um, and with that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll sort of uh, clap on behalf of everybody, uh, but thank you very much for that great presentation. So let's just open it up for questions. Um, I know you know some people have asked things in the chat, and have and and those may or may not have been addressed um, completely throughout the talk. But but uh, if if folks have questions, especially students, please feel free to um, ask. I'll get the ball rolling. Um, so it, it seems like, so this high information versus low information setting seems to be the key. How do you know which situation you're in? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think that's, I, I mean, I think that's the question that's really like the sort of, to, for not, to, to do this completely correctly, you need, you know, some sort of randomization of who you've admitted and then some being able to have some estimates of true skill. Right, so that's that, that's the gold standard, um, like to be able to know which situation you're in. Um, of course, we're never like, or very few schools that are ever going to be in that gold standard, and so um, I do think it's yeah, I think that's an open question of are there, and I think this is um, a, a great applied stats question for this audience, which is are there proxies that can get at which information setting we're in, like given that we're never going to have that gold standard. Right. Yeah. I mean, big part of the problem is we don't see who we don't admit. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think places like, and I mean, this is what I'd be pushing for, right? Is that like places like UC Berkeley does, or like not use the UC system, right? So like, uh, for, example, right. for example, in this, um, in this Theop data set, in this Texas data set, um, they actually have a lot more universities than just UT. They have um, sort of, they have every UT system. Every, besides UT Austin, they have all the schools in the UT system and they have applicants and they have admissions. Unfortunately, um, they don't link students across universities. So they don't, like a student who applied to two different universities has unique IDs. And part of the terms and services is that you can't link, you can't even try to link students across universities um, for privacy reasons. And um, so like, as an outside researcher, um, I can't do that, but like certainly someone at like the UT system or the UC system could um, try to do that. Or, you know, like graduate schools can do this somewhat, right? Is like the, the PhD class of, of, or like the master's class is not that big. Like you could try to see everyone who applied, certainly at the PhD level, you can see where do they end up going for their PhD and like how do they end up doing five years later. That's like not an impossible task to do. Yeah, although defining success in all of yeah. these is, is super tricky. So. <laughs> yes. All right, I'm going to let someone else ask. So, uh, Nikhil, I, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I think one thing I've, I've studied this area too long, and w one thing I'm always saying is that there's not enough formal modeling uh, where we're laying out our assumptions from first principles, and I think it's really important to, to advance us past the same sort of politicized arguments that we keep hearing. One thing I think would be interesting to consider, um, even just so leaving aside the modeling, the fact that the, the you know the, the university, the, the, the post-secondary institutions are strategic actors, that there's a lot of other factors happening here, but just at the student observable test score distribution level, there's some really interesting artifacts because of the way the system works, right? So I, I actually think it's less that the 
that the test, so, so because there's so much widespread availability of the test that's being subsidized either through the test makers or through uh, government, basically almost everybody has an opportunity to have one score observed. What's interesting is that the wealthier families can pay basically to get better draws from the distribution until they get the one they like. And you can see this really easily looking at ACT has all their data available on Tableau state by state. And you can just look at what happens by score choice. Like, so the ones who look and see, oh, here's what the state does wherever, you know, it's an ACT state and here's what happens when actually the kids can look. And it's, it's a classic sort of truncated shifted over distribution. So actually I'd love to see, because if I were actually trying to figure this out at, at an institution, I'd, I'd want to know, in fact, what I'm really getting is two types of, just two, two distributions, not two variances. And they're, wow easily modelable and they're even empirically modelable because we have those data but um, what that yeah. what that impact is um yeah i, I think that's exactly right there so they're actually i can send this to you offline there there actually is um by another set of researchers i think from upenn and rice um who um sort of construct a model like sort of like this um where they uh, allow one set of students to like retake the test many times um the sort of i think he sort of here yeah, so, so I, I think I think what you said is interesting is that it's basically there's something beyond a normal distribution here going on. Like it's not just like the the canard that I said of oh you have means that can be canceled out and then variances that can be like that's not true, right? Like there's like an arbitrary distribution shift with that like mixes in bias shifts and like information like sort of like some sort of entropy shifts and like you need to model that exactly. Um, I think what's interesting there is what can, and I'd love to hear this from you, is what can school, like, if a school knows the shift is happening, and which it does, of course, and if even if the school doesn't know at the individual level who took it multiple times, is like, how much can they do this correction? I, I mean, that's where I think that the decision problem on the institution side matters, because, you know, this is going to sound cynical, right, but, but what you're doing, so, they don't want to take everybody above a certain ability threshold. They want to take everybody that's inexpensive to them. And then everybody who's above a much lower, but uh, remediable ability threshold that they can get through and look good. Right. And, and so there's a question of like needing to identify a minimum competency threshold that is way lower than was probably, you know, advertised and making sure that they can sort of fill that up into the, the quota that they have internally and then filling the rest with, a complex multi-dimensional thing, but that's what you can abstract the rest of that away. But I do think be, because it, you, you need to model that side of it, because then we'll have to see whether or not that the truncation of the ability distribution for the high group matters or not, or if they really don't care because they're so far away from that threshold. I mm -hmm. think there are a lot of people, but put it another way, there are a lot of people paying to take these tests over and over again and paying for uh, test prep that's probably not helping that actually has no input into their probability of admission. Yeah. So um, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just flag one more question in the chat, um, and you know maybe we can address it real quick, and then and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, Chian Shia asked in the chat, um, how is the cost of taking and preparing standardized tests, including in the model? Say, for example, such costs might be lower in China compared to the U.S. Would such factors impact the conclusions? Um, yeah. So I, I think. The, the mapping from the model to the like any empirical setting is of course the hardest part. Um, the sort of how I would think about that here is um, the sort of is the I guess on the on the taking the test aspect, which is like we could we can model that as just like the access levels, right? Is that like if you think about the students from China being one group that you care about and like you know those from the US being another group, you could model that as differential access um, of the test. And also, of course, integrate different, like, different um, like, you know, distributions and like the mean and the variance and so on. Um, I think what that's hinting at though, which is there's those like, of course, there's like huge weirdly intersectional thing going on that we don't even touch where like the, the group measurements that you have might be different than the groups that you care to balance on, right? Is that you, like, you, for example, you like in this test optional setting, you might explicitly care to be fair to people who don't have access to the test, but you don't actually observe if someone has access. You just observe whether someone took the test or not, which is a strategic decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think 
I think there's some of that going on in the question as well, but I don't have a precise answer. Well, thank you. Um, and so why don't we wrap it up um, for right now? And uh, let's just thank our speaker again for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Clap on behalf of everybody. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording and thank you everybody for attending.